Hey gang, check this out. This is my kid's jar of coconut oil. And she puts it on her hair, I guess. I, I don't really tend to know too much about that. Okay, coconut oil, let me pour it out. Oh, I can't pour it out. It's solid at room temperature. Why? Because the chains on coconut oil's molecules are saturated. Saturated chains are straighter. Remember London forces? The, Lon the London forces can act more effectively when the chains are straight. Here's what we call in science canola oil. That's liquidy because it is unsaturated. Hey, it says also no trans fat. What does that mean? We'll talk about that today. Saturated, unsaturated, trans, and other things. Uh, that's a bag of beans, which has nothing to do with this video. I was just messing with you people who play the videos on 2x speed. Anyhow, today we're going to talk about uh, organic chemistry some more. And uh, now, if you, you got to go back and refresh yourself possibly that we, last time we talked about a lot, even though we only visited a family and a little bit more, today we are going to go in a little faster success, six, 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 <clears throat> speed as we uh, visit the different families but we already know the naming system we know what isomers are and so you got a lot of tools in your toolbox that we're gonna get back out again so the next thing to do is talk about what happens when something is different in the chain that is the base chain of an organic compound the term for that is called the functional group. It is usually the most reactive part of the molecule where the functional group is. For example, alkenes, the, the functional group, is a carbon-carbon double bond. And that can react with a bunch of things like hydrogen or halogens, and uh, you can do what they call open up that double bond where it can then be converted to something saturated. And, by the way, now we're talking about chains that don't have their full complement of two times the number of carbons plus two hydrogens. And so every double bond you make, you've got to take off two hydrogens, and that's why they call these things unsaturated. All right? And the way you could find that out, you could burn it. It doesn't burn as clean. That's a, uh, another little trick. But anyhow, let's continue on with alkenes. Uh, same naming scheme, except two things. The suffix is going to be ene. So if you see something end with ene, you could say that's an alkene. The other thing is, when we number the chain now, if we have a group on there, like our example, that's going to take a, a back seat to numbering the functional group. So the first thing you do with any compound with a functional group is you number the chain to give the functional group this, the lowest uh, number. So, so we're going to name this bad boy here. Same kind of procedure, folks. You're going to find the base chain, which here has one, two, three, four carbons. And so this is going to be but in Remember, we're in alkenes here. And now I got a methyl group, so it's going to be, you know, methyl. There's only one methyl. Methyl butene. And now where's the methyl group? Okay, we're not going to number from the right here. We're going to number to give the functional group the smallest number. Ah, oh, doggone it, guys. I screwed up one thing. Let's go back in time. Butene. There's all sorts of butenes. You know, the, the double bond could be between carbon 1 and 2, 2 and 3. And so we indicate this in the name as well. So what we do is we don't just call this butene. We call this 1 butene. The base chain is called 1-butene. And now we continue 
and number the chain. That's why. And you might say, why don't we call it 1,2-butene? Well, it's understood that a double bond is between two atoms. So one other sub-narrative is we want to make the name as short as possible. So we just call it 1. You always list the smallest number of the carbon that is attached to a double bond. And, and someone who reads butene knows that that's a double bond between carbons 1 and 2. And then so here's our 3-methyl now. So 1, 2, 3. 3 methyl, 1 butene. And that's it. That's the name. Sorry about the goof up when I forgot the number of the, the chain. All right? So that's the difference between something with a functional group is we're going to give it a base name, give the number that is uh, where the functional group is, and then sub-priority is to attach the different groups. Now, uh, do you notice when I was talking about canola oil, I used the term trans. And so what we have here is the possibility of uh, there being different kinds of isomers. These aren't uh, structural isomers like the ones we did with the alkanes a gazillion times, right? These are actually what we call geometrical isomers, or sometimes they're called, uh, or sometimes they're called geometrical isomers, but they use the term cis and trans. So if we were to name these two compounds, uh, you would arrive at the idea that, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to find the base chain, and even though it's on this kind of crooked path in both cases, you would say, all right, well, this is uh, uh, going to be butene, and don't do like what I did last time. You'd number from either end to give the group, the functional group, the smallest number, and so you'd say, hey, they're both two butene, but hey, they look different. That's, that's a thing. Uh, do they behave different? Heck yeah, they do. I was talking about London forces before. Uh, if you have a chain that is more crooked, like the one on the right, those things don't pack in very closely together, and those are what you find in a lot of things that are tended not to solidify. And so what we got to do is we got we to remember our good old Vesper theory from Gen Chem 1. Each of these carbons uh, on the double bond is trigonal planar. That means that this bond angle is 120 degrees and this molecule is really kind of flat. And therefore, you get a different shape when the chain kind of goes across the double bond as opposed to when it's on the same side. So we have names for that. We call them one cis and one trans. So this would be called the cis this would be called the trans. Now let's let's go with the easier one to explain. And, and this has like Latin roots or something like that. Trans means across, right? You take a transatlantic flight, you go across the ocean. And so uh, you see how that went across the, the double bond there. And uh, cis sort of means same side as. So, so what we would do is now, in addition to calling this 2-butene, there can't be any John Smiths in the world of uh, organic chemistry naming. We would say this is cis, 2-butene, and we would say that this guy is trans, 2-butene. And uh, well, just for fun, C4H8. That's its formula. Let's go try to find the other isomers. What if I put that double bond between carbon 1 and 2? Uh, now, you, I'm going to draw it like trigonal planar there to show, to make a point. Uh, when you have the double bond on the end of the chain, you don't, those are two hydrogens. And if I were to flip those two hydrogens, you wouldn't be making any change to the structure of it. You're just swapping a hydrogen for a hydrogen. But do you see where if I did that up above, if I took this one carbon and flipped it with a hydrogen, I'd get this one. And so we don't have cis and trans when it's 1-butene, which, by the way, that's what this is, 1-butene. All right, 1-butene. That's an isomer. And what if I branched it? Where can I branch it? I, I can really only branch it, uh, you know, to give it four carbons on the end like that. 
what would that be called? That would be called propene. Do you call it one propene? Well, you could. It's making the name too long. There is no other place to put a double bond but on a propene, but between carbons one and two. So you can get away without naming that one propene because if I put that double bond there, it would be as if I just flipped the whole molecule. You'd still get one propene. So I'm just going to call it uh, methyl propene. Remember, you want to make the name as short as possible. And you'd be like, hey, how come you didn't call it one propene? There's no other kind of propene than the double bond can't be between anything but carbon one and two because you start numbering the chain to make the functional group have the slowest, the lowest number. Hey, how come I didn't call it two methyl? Because there's no other place on a three carbon chain. I could put the methyl group on a, on a propene but carbon two. If I moved it to carbon three, I'd just have that, one butene. So there's your four isomers, and notice only two of them have cis and trans possibilities. And that is when you don't have the carbon, carbon double bond at the end of the chain. All right, we're knocking out families here, folks. I mean, you know, in a nice way. And uh, you notice I didn't do some sort of crazy joke there. That's, that would be not good. So, uh, okay. So anyhow, let's uh, talk about a couple more families of hydrogens. Okay. What if we took two more hydrogens off? and made a triple bond. Well, let me tell you this, folks. What happens is, in nature, triple bonds are very, very reactive. And so, if you were going to take hydrogens off of something, you're going to find in nature that repeating double bonds happens way before you find a triple bond. Go Google the structure of vitamin E or vitamin uh, D and you'll see repeating double bonds. But let's talk about alkynes next. So, uh, you notice when we talked about alkenes, the suffix was ene, and so now we're talking about alkynes, and the suffix is ine. So, if you kind of, if you remember what family it is, that's sort of telling you what the suffix is. And so, what we do is same kind of thing. I gotta, I gotta give it a base name. So, let's name this guy here. All right. And what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, C seven H. Not 14, 2 times 7 is 14, H12. And you go count. Go count. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 hydrogens on this. Remember, a dash out to nothing is like a hydrogen. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the longest chain and give it the suffix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is hex ein. Where's the functional group? I have to number the chain to give the functional group the smallest number. I could do one, two, three. I could do one, two, three. It's a tie. So it's going to be three hexine. Okay, what's the tiebreaker? Kind of like with alkanes, what happens is now, since it doesn't matter which end, I number the chain to give the functional group its number. Now the tiebreaker is to give the groups the smallest numbers. So now one, two, three. So uh, this is two methyl, three hexine. Fair enough. You see the system keeps repeating itself. And so, you know, uh, every family we go to, you're going to do the same thing. You're going you're to find the longest continuous chain. You're going to number the chain in such a way to give the functional group the smallest number, and then the groups fall into place unless there's a weird thing that happens like a tiebreaker here. Hey, remember I was talking about double bonds being more stable than single bonds? Our final hydrocarbon family uh, is going to be what we call aromatic compounds. The functional group is a benzene ring. So this is a ring, this, this right here would be benzene. All right, C6H6. And there's abbreviations. Here's the line structure. 
They haven't done too many line structures today. Sometimes they even do this. You know, that's another, that's quicker to draw. There's a reason that they do that ring, and actually if you go back to hybrid orbitals, it's a big old pie smear, and it makes kind of a big old ring. And that's a flat structure, and it's, it repeats quite often. Go look at this, go Google the structure of aspirin. There's a benzene ring in it. Uh, now, you know what happens is, uh, this happens when molecules get complex, like uh, aromatic compounds do. Uh, sometimes they end up, and this is the reason we're not going to get into naming them too much. Uh, sometimes you get into these kinds of things. Hey, what's this compound here? Methylbenzene? Well, you're not wrong to call it that. But toluene is what you're going to hear it called more often. It's kind of a bummer of a system, right? Because if you go Google methylbenzene, you probably won't find as much info on that compound as you do toluene. And some of these things, by the way, aren't too good for you. Benzene, suspected carcinogen. Uh, toluene is in gasoline. There's a certain amount of it. You know, the, the earth burps up this black stuff. Actually, we drill for it. And then if it burns in your car, it goes into gasoline. There's a decent amount of toluene and gasoline is pretty poisonous, uh, not good to breathe or, or ingest. Uh, so, you know, it's not really that great to fill your car up and then get a big whiff of gasoline. Uh, so there's a lot of toluene and gasoline. I want a little tangent there. Phenol, that's in chloroseptic throat spray. So, uh, you know, it's, why don't we call it hydroxybenzene or something like that? They get nicknames sometimes. All right, put three nitrogens on here. You know, a, nitro a nitrogen, not nit nitrate, not nitrogen. Put a nitrate here, nitrate there, and a nitrate there in three spots. You got trinitrotoluene, TNT. Oi, oi, let's talk about inviting oxygen to the party next. All right, one of my favorite families, alcohols, all right? You know, you got a, a isopropyl alcohol. Now the problem is there's a lot of old school and new school naming. So the new school way to name something is to just throw on the suffix anol. So let's take something simple like one of my favorites. That's eth anol, that's new. Ethanol. What's old? Ethyl alcohol. Ethanol is more concise, one word, and ethyl alcohol. When you go and you buy, uh, when you go and you get, go to the stock room at the college where I work, and you go look in the stock room, the bottle says ethyl alcohol. So there's a lot of inertia with old and new names. I'm going to go with a new name because it's a better system uh, because it makes shorter names. So let's go and name this thing. The suffix is anol, right? Ooh, I gave us a line structure. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make my chain first. And I almost daydreamed my way into screwing up there. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like I got a methyl group on carbon two. Remember, each bend is a carbon. Looks like I got an OH on carbon. Oh, Freudian slip. I should have numbered the chain, right? But I numbered the chain because I knew that the OH has to have the smallest number. That's the functional group now. That takes charge. And so the way I would number this chain is I would go through and, well, first of all, let's identify the base chain. The base chain is six carbons long, and so this is hex, is the prefix for six, and all. Hex and all. Where's the OH? Does it have to be there? No, it could have been on carbons one, two, three. So we're going to number the chain to give 
the functional group, the smallest number. If I numbered it the other way, that would be carbon four. And so the correct way to number the chain would be to number from the side that gives the functional group the smallest number. And now I got a methyl group and carbon two. So it would be, it'd be two methyl. Three hexanol. That is the uh, that is the name of that bad boy. Okay, I do want to kind of talk to you about what happens if you have two OH uh, OHs on there. Is that possible? Oh yeah, it is. This would be a good example. That guy. What we do is we call that a di to all. And so this would be uh, two OHs on carbons one and two. And so we would call this though ethane di all. You know, if there was two on the one we did before, that'd be hexane diol. And now what happens is where do those OHs have to be? Well, they, they don't have to be on carbons one and two. You could have two OHs on carbon one. Uh, you could have that OH would be right there. Heck, you could put three OHs on carbon one. And um, so what we do is we number the chain to give the functional group the smallest number. It doesn't end up mattering which way you go. Carbons one and two, one, two, ethane, ethane diol. That's the uh, official name of that now. But remember, old school, new school, old school is ethylene glycol. What's that in? Antifreeze. Super de duper polar, pretty heavy. A lot of London forces, very polar, a lot of, dot, a lot of H bonds, hydrogen bonds. And this is the thing in your antifreeze, which keeps it from freezing, as we talked about before, and boiling, so it should be called antifreeze boil. Are you ready for the lightning round? This is where we talk about carbonyl compounds. Now, this is where we have oxygen involved. And these are very difficult and a lot of my students get them mixed up so please pace yourself as you look at these structures. Oh, um, you know what I never talked about? What's R mean? Sorry. R means any chain. So for example with alcohols, you know, aldehydes, that could be, that chain could be one carbon, two carbons, 14 carbons, it could be branched, it could be anything. It's an aldehyde if you got it. All these things are called carbonyl compounds because it's got a C double bond O. That's a very common thing you find in uh, uh, nature. And as you know, you probably saw some weak acids with a C double bond O in them. But let's go in order here of uh, the way they appear on this sheet. Uh, an aldehyde is if the C double bond O is at the end of the chain. So uh, you've got an H there. So a ketone is where the C double bond O is not at the end of the chain. So we could have, you know, this carbon chain could be any, any length. This carbon chain could be any length. And so aldehydes and ketones are very, very similar looking. Uh, so when people get them mixed up once in a while. A carboxylic acid, like acetic acid, meh, see that's the old way of naming it. Ethanoic acid would be the new way to name it. Uh, is when you have a carbon chain with a C double bond O and then an OH. And that H on the end is the thing that pops off in, uh, in you know, some of the population of molecules because they're usually weak. And they're your fatty acids too. So what do you do? Oh, geez, folks, I hate to say it. A lot of you are destined for organic chemistry. It's just a lot of surface memory. So if you're a good surface memorizer, you got to memorize those three names and the uh, structures. And so uh, I'll show you how to name them next here. Uh, the way we do that is we uh, go ahead and we give it a now is the name here. I was being very nice there, really holding back. That's a now. 
That's how you say it, all right? That's analdehyde, anal. Ketone, unknown. Carboxylic acid, oic acid. So let's go and name this fella here. That is an aldehyde. And so it is three carbons long base chain. So this would be called propanel. Do I call it one propanel? You don't have to. Why? To make the name as short as possible, all aldehydes have the functional group on the end. So do carboxylic acids. So you don't have to say one propanal, or you'd just be doing that with everything that's an aldehyde, like one ethanal, one butanal, one hexanal. I do have to address that there's a methyl group there. And to be honest with you, it couldn't be anywhere but that carbon. You couldn't put it on the end, that would be butanal, so you could just call that methyl propanal. If you, if you put it, that methyl group here, now it's a ketone. If you say 2-methylpropanal, if you say 2-methyl-1-propanal, you're not really egregiously wrong. You're just making the name longer and you're not really adhering to the system. All right? Let's look at this. This is a ketone. And so that's going to be four carbons long. And that is butanone. Do I uh, say it's 2-butanone? <laughs> Guess what? You don't have to. Is there any other butanone where the carbon uh, C double bond O would be anywhere but on carbon uh, 2? What if that was over there? You just number it the other way. Let's take a longer one though. You know, let's say this was like something like this. You know, that would be one, two, three, four, five. This would be pentanone. And here, there could be two isomers. I could have three pentanone if that carbon double bond to the O would be right there, for example, right in the middle one. So here I do have to say that that's two pentanone. All right. Is there a one pentanone? No. That would be uh, pentanel. If I put that C double bond O all the way at the end, now it's an aldehyde. So, uh, see, so there's very subtle differences there. Uh, and there you go. Oic acid is the new way to name the carboxylic acid. So if you go here and you say, what's going to always happen with a carboxylic acid is that the functional groups at the end on the last carbon over and so you just count them one, two, three, four, five. This is pentanoic acid. Do I have to say one? Nope. Just like aldehydes, the functional groups always at the end. And so uh, there you go. That's about everything really that has an oxygen. Whoopsie! Except one more thing. Because some of you are going to organic chemistry where you will deal with ethers. That probably sounds familiar, right? They used to give it to you at the dentist to knock people out. Not knock them out, make them loopy, you know? Here's what an ether is. Carbon chain, bonded to an oxygen, other carbon chain. And so you're going to find out that like uh, uh, there's an old school way and a new school way to name these. And actually there's a lot of inertia with ethers more than anything. So if I took something, um, let's, just, let's just show you an example. And by the way, you remember how water bonds, you know, water bonds, uh, you know, the oxygen and water bonds uh, that way. So what you would end up doing is you'd end up calling this just like diethyl ether. 
Now, that, that oxygen being in the center, that's a polar bond to the carbon and oxygen, but it's not on the end like an alcohol. So ethers usually have very, very low boiling points, and they can burn. And so that's why when you're dealing with ether in any situation, and that's probably why they don't use it at the dentist that often anymore. You know, they give you like laughing gas or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, it's dangerous. Can't smoke around it. Not that anybody smokes anymore. There's like one square foot on the whole state where anybody smokes. But those are ethers. And I thought since we were talking about oxygen being a participant now, then uh, we would throw them in there. That's another functional group. Uh, that you would see with oxygen. And uh, that's about enough for today, I think, folks. You have done a great deal here. And you see, though, that there is different, so much diversity in organic chemistry, which means you got so much memorizing to do. And uh, that's why I, frankly, didn't really like it that much. Can I say that? I just said that. I'm telling the truth here. I'm a truth teller sometimes, and I haven't even had any ethyl ether. Uh, yet. Okay, take care folks. Happy organicking.